I'm sure you're all eager to stop listening and start talking. Um, there is on the program a uh, essential question that we organized for the town hall meeting, and I'm going to turn over the rest of the program, except a goodbye, to Dr. Mentor. Wow, okay. That came quickly. <laughs> All right, folk. Let's do a classroom strategy in three, two, one. Let's try that again. Three, two, and one. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for those of you who have been with us for the whole day, those of you who have to leave because of other engagements. We appreciate you coming and joining in on this conversation with us. And so I'm going to moderate the town hall. I'm sure you have <laughs> or comments. Um, there are two mic stands on each side um, of me. And so I'm going to invite folk who have questions um, either of Dr. Snow or the panel in general um, to come to the front, ask your question, and we will engage in conversation. We can't promise that there will be absolute answers to questions and thoughts, but we can have conversation. Let me, um, let me start by asking you all a question, since you're in various stages of uh, development here. Um, I, there, w there was a hint, I think it was uh, I think it was Marcella, somebody who said, or and also Mary, something about, you know, if a first-year teacher might want to rely on a script, a fifth-year teacher wants to rewrite the script, a tenth-year teacher doesn't need the script at all. Um, so to, to talk a little bit about the developmental process and to what degree the pre-service education program needs to move toward the, here's the script, here's the model, here's the thing you do on Monday, or, or maybe not. I mean, this is an open question, and I've never been in a teacher education program, so I'm not gonna, I'm certainly um, soliciting information. And to, and to what extent the, the organizing models and the access to the background research is useful at that stage or more useful at a later stage? So my teacher, I saw Jess's hand go up. You want to come to the mic? Yeah, perfect. Thank you. And anybody else who has a thought can come down in the meantime and bring yourself to the next side. Perfect. All right, folks. Um, I'm Jess Riccio. I'm in science education. I'm the teacher educator in science education here, uh, representing, of course, I have colleagues. But one of the things um, that I think is really important to note, and please allow my scientific um, analogies, is that we really function as an ecosystem here. And I think it's really important, if you're familiar with the American Museum of Natural History in the Hall of uh, Life, that we look at this tree, and on the tree there's many branches, and the branches each fulfill a different need in the ecosystem. And that's, I think, what I think we're seeing here at TC. Um, one of the things that came up earlier that I think is really important exciting is that um, Dr. Snow talked about basically engaging students in things they care about. You know, we call that, in my domain, socio-scientific issues, but it's kind of what we're doing. But to the point or the question that's been posed, what's really hard, and I'll say this from the point of view of someone who prepares 7th through 12th grade teachers, is that we predicate our program on the principles of inquiry. But I know from working with Susan and others on campus um, that there are certain times when you're in a 7th to 12th grade classroom, specifically in science, where explicit instruction is necessary. So we have to mitigate that tension between being a constructivist and, and loving and wanting to marry inquiry, but at the same time, in certain cases when students are struggling, providing explicit instruction. And I find that you have to explicitly say that as a teacher educator. Um, the thing I found most interesting in my journey on this uh, literacy escape is that when you take the time, and this has been a real help for me when I go into schools, when you take the time to analyze what practices are necessary to do inquiry, 
you'll notice that the standards in English are actually the same as the standards in science. And we use that synapomorphy, or that node of intersection, as the way to build buy-in. And I think that that's one of the things that in the web of interconnectedness that we have here at TC helps to inform our practice. And our teachers take the courses of each one another, and they realize that tolerance is necessary to acquire. Thank you so much. Hello, hi. Good afternoon, uh, my name is Melinda Lovsky. I'm a graduate of the Teaching of English program here at uh, TC. My late mother was a teacher, and so after she passed away, my father endowed a scholarship here at TC. It's the MA of Teaching of English program scholarship for James Stefanski. So, obviously, teacher's college is very important to me. I am currently teaching at a private country day school in Brooklyn. I started my journey at Bronx Science, Hunter College Campus Schools. So my current role is very different from um, the one I began my career as a teacher as. But I think we can all agree that in the last three years, um, the attrition in reading and exposure to in-person instruction due to COVID has taken a major toll on our young readers. I currently teach fifth um, and eighth grade. And I can't expect that the onus of the burden be on my colleagues at the lower school to ameliorate the situation. So what recommendations do you all have in terms of what I can do as an individual, but also my school can do to help get kids back on track, um, whether it be individually in the classroom or recommending support at home with parents? Thank you. Oh, do we have a taker for that question? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I'm reading specialist. <laughs> I think I think we need to leave the kids alone. Mm -hmm. right. I, I think they bear a lot of emotional baggage because all they hear is that we've lost so much in the last two, three years. Um, I think we should go back to teaching them the way that we used to teach before, try to fill in gaps, for those kids who really lag behind, give them some more intensive instruction, encourage successes on their parts, and let parents read to their kids and let them enjoy language. All right. So, and just make them feel good about themselves as readers and as learners. I love that answer, and I support that. I'm, I'm not a big fan of the, of the deficit talk. My students know, I'm like, yeah, we, we, we all have challenges, we all have struggles, how can we, how can we help build back up, right? You know, it's so important that kids leave every day of school feeling something that they're Correct, yes. correct. Right. Right. And that takes a, a, a sense of teacher. Yeah. And that only comes with experience, I right. can't teach that. Yeah. And if you, for those of you who couldn't hear because there was no mic, Kids need to leave every day from school with some measure of success, right? That also takes a savvy teacher with experience and it's not something that we can necessarily have from the get-go, but it's something that we work and build for ourselves in our own teacher experience, which is why I'm a big proponent of cohorts, I'm a big proponent of sharing resources so that people have somewhere to go to and I'm a huge proponent of mentorship, right? Like solid mentorship. Question to my left and then to my right. It's actually not a question, but it's feedback and a comment also to your um, question, which is, um, my name is Yvette Russell. I feel like I'm in a room of brilliance. I'm actually um, the senior strategy officer for an after-school literacy program. And what I will say is our teachers for the after-school program are the same teachers during the day school. We use a leveled curriculum. You all have partners. The school day is extended, and so you have brilliance that is continuing during the after-school programming. So that is an additional resources, not only for teachers, but for families. And for our youngest students, I mean, Read Alliance is the organization that I represent. And we actually hire, train, and pay teenagers to serve as one-to-one -one reading tutors after school. And it's an evidence-based curriculum that we use. So there is brilliance happening all the way around. We're actually getting ready to do an analysis of the impact that we're seeing in our kids. It's a 23-year organization. 
you know, high school kids are making money, they are happy, and we know that inherently they're benefiting from having this experience. Yes. A lot of them are going on to education um, as a practice for themselves because they see themselves in the little kid that's in that classroom. Correct. They remember what it was like. And, and again, the deficit language, we call our readers striving readers, not struggling readers, right? They are on the path. They come with knowledge. They come with intent. They come with experience. And whether it's the, the five, six, seven-year-olds or it's the high school kids. So you all have partners. You know, um, we are, it's not just Read Alliance. There are a lot of other good organizations out there that are willing to support and can support the education and the literacy of our little kids. So just wanted to add that. <laughs> Thank you. Go up. Hi, my name is Bridget Mooney, and I'm actually also an alum of the Early Childhood and Elementary um, Pre-Service Program. 97, Marjorie Siegel was my literacy professor. Um, and I just want to circle back to what can we do as teacher educators. Uh, one thing that I felt I gained from the program here, and I think set me apart from colleagues in the field, was my preparation with um, curriculum development. Mm -hmm. That's something that we do very well here, and I was able to hit the ground running with that. And that really helped me have a teacher identity by the time I graduated and entered my first classroom experience. Also, um, I don't know if it was the timing, the mid-90s, or, or just having that strong teacher identity, but um, I, wasn't, I wasn't going into the field thinking about the constraints and the structures. I was thinking about what was possible and what my, you know, the creativity and, and, and everything that I could bring so there's something about the TC program that enabled me to kind of be an advocate and be an activist from the get-go. And I'm, I'm concerned now in working you know, in teacher ed that there's too much concern about the structures and the constraints and teaching, preparing teachers to work within those constraints as opposed to <coughs> preparing them to kind of push back against the constraints mm -hmm. and work around those structures. Mm -hmm. um, but that idea of professional capital, sending teachers out into the field with the really strong curriculum development skills, having that as a tool, um, being authors of, you know, of your practice. Thank you. I see that a lot with my own students. Um, our program is very social justice oriented, um, and so they come back with, we learn all these things here at Teachers College, but we don't get to practice it in the schools where we're doing our practice teaching or where we're um, full-time teachers, right? Because it's conscripted, it's controlled, and all of those things. And so to balance that as a teacher is sometimes hard, but also one of the things that comes with um, the continued discussion, the continued engagement, um, and the continued support and mentorship from like-minded folk. So. Comes next. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Jeffrey Omar Patrick. I go by Jeffrey Omar. I'm a doctoral candidate here at Teachers College in the Health and Behavior Department. And uh, I've just been hired by TC to teach a course this summer. I'll be teaching addiction and dependency. I'm also an assistant professor at New York Medical College. And I teach at CUNY, which is the uh, narrative and the medicine course, right? So, I came here today because I have a problem, right? I got a six-year-old going on 60, right? This guy is proficient in every subject in his school, except for reading, right? He will not read. Even when it's just at bedtime, he wants me to read, but he doesn't want to read. I can't get him off the iPad but he wants, you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. How can I get this six-year-old to like reading more? And I'm telling you, in math, brilliant. Art, science, computer, he's a whiz. But he will not read. What is up? <laughs> Take away the iPad. That was my, <laughs> that, that was my response. Take it away. <laughs> Take him to a bookstore, give him 50 bucks, tell him he can buy any books, up to 50 bucks worth, that he's interested in. Yeah? Fair enough. Thank you. Uh, uh, wait, hold on, I see, I see hands, yeah. I see hands. 
I want to say too that it's perfectly acceptable for a six-year-old not to read for fun and pleasure. And I want to say it's also perfectly acceptable for humans to not like to read. There's a lot of talk about like, oh, disappear in a book. Well, I'll tell you, I have three kids who will never disappear in a book. So that's just the fact, right? Print is actually a very new invention in human evolution. And the fact that he wants you to read to him, you should treasure that. And reading at bedtime is not him showing you he can read. Reading at bedtime is loving his dad. I, I see two hands. I just have to say, Celia, I thought I agreed with you on everything. But not loving to read is a huge impoverishment of your life. It really is. And it is a limitation on opportunities to learn, which is much, much, much worse about it. So at six, it can be addressed. At 18, it probably can't. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Quick 50 bucks. You can stand at the back door with a collection hat, and maybe some of us will chip in. This Yeah. If he's okay in those subjects, that means he's reading. He, he may be, he may like science and he may like history and reading the stories may be an issue. Interesting. So I'm going to ask that, that we have this conversation, continue it later, if that's okay. Anybody else who has advice, step in. I want to bring us back to um, this idea of given the highly politicized nature of literacy instruction at this point in schooling, how are we preparing teachers to navigate these waters, right? Um, I forget which way, to the right, yes. Um, hi everyone, my name is uh, Imran Hussain. I, um, I actually, I'm, I'm not a teacher uh, other than teaching uh, my own three kids. Uh, my oldest is now in college and my youngest is a fifth grader. Um, I run an education technology startup that's focused on how teachers can increase technology integration and integrate better into their curriculum. And in that role, I kind of routinely speak with district leaders and instructional technology leaders and teachers across the country um, You know, for the last year and a half or so that I've been on this journey. and. Um, what I routinely hear is teachers are overwhelmed. COVID has done a number on teachers. Teachers are getting pulled in many different directions. Teachers are fatigued. Um, one great example, one example of that is, you know, last week we did a panel discussion on, on data and the use of data in, to inform instruction. And we had 12 district leaders from across the country, including New York. Um, and one of the things that came up was, well, teachers are kind of being expected to be pseudo data analysts now, because you got data from student information systems, LMS systems, this, that, and the other, and now this is just one more thing that teachers have to do, and it, it basically adds to the fatigue and, and teachers being overwhelmed. My question to the panel, and I guess maybe to the audience is, do we see this, this becoming less? Do we see teachers, well first do we agree that teachers are overwhelmed, and, and if we do, do we see signs that this may get better, and, and or are there ways in which this fatigue and this being overwhelmed can be solved for teachers on a, on a sustainable basis? Or is it just COVID uh, and then we'll naturally fall out of this or is this a trend that needs to be reversed somehow? Do you want to try, Celia? Let me ask this as a question. Um, I'm curious to see if this rings true for everybody here. The teachers I work with, um, both pre-service and then you know, cooperating teachers, teachers in the field, 
yes, overwhelmed, but it's not the teaching. The teaching is the part that feeds us, that keeps us alive. That's why we're there. It's the highly politicized nature um, that, and, and of course, I, I don't want to simplify. Um, that, you know, this is an incredibly complex topic. Um, what is overwhelming? But I do think it's important to emphasize that when we're talking about what it is to be a teacher or a teacher of reading, most teachers, they live to do this. This is the work that we, we train to do, we study to do, we want to be doing. Um, so I don't know, I, I'd love to hear from other people in the audience about that question of teacher overwhelm. So classroom size, yes. it's pretty Absolutely. tough. Yeah. A teacher, 30 kids, yes. Hot, that's tough to individualize. Yeah. And what we have talked about here is understanding the individual mm -hmm. within a group. Yeah. Not the group, the individual mm -hmm. in the group. Oh. How do you do that with 30 kids Absolutely. and innumerable administrative meetings, this and that and that and this. Tough to do. So we're actually looking at how do we reduce class size like the private schools where you pay for that. I think, I think that's such a, a, that it's not the teaching that exhausts us, right? We love that, that's why we go back every day. It's the administrative work and all the, all the extra meta work that is in fact the thing that, that you know, takes away from our ability to do our actual job, which is teaching. Hi, I'm Debbie Meyer. I spent three years as an Alayla Bundles community scholar on all the campuses, including this campus of Columbia University, looking at the role of the university in ending the dyslexia to prison pipeline. I'm now the um, Chief Operating Officer of the Dyslexia Alliance for Black Children and working with advocates around the country. And despite the podcasts and the articles, nobody is a phonics-only advocate. We're all very worried about phonics light and worried about people not um, having the time and parents not understanding that the reading rope. And that is the center of the reading rope that's important and the intertwining of uh, word and, and language and knowledge. And that kids shouldn't get their pullouts for extra literacy instruction or speech instruction during social studies or science or even phys ed or, 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 or art because that's where they learn language. So how can we help leaders design school days so that there is time and how can we help people understand the difference between phonics and phonics light? So that's the discussions I'd like to have and it'd be great to have your school leadership programs involved in these conversations as well, because I think that's where these cultures are fit. Phonics light is sometimes taught with kids' names, and names are often not very phonetic. Um, sometimes onset rhyme, but like a friend named Risha that is spelled R-E-S-H-A, not particularly phonetic. And so kids can't use that for phonics. So, but um, that would be an exception in phonics rather than using it for phonics. Um, a phonics, a real phonics would follow a scope and sequence. Um, it would build on that scope and sequence like, you know, you teach um, addition before multiplication. Um, so you teach things in an order. Yeah. Uh, phonics light is is phonics not taught well, <laughs> haphazardly. Thank you so much for your comment, and I love the idea of school leadership and and executive getting involved in this conversation. Right. Um, Hi, uh, I'm Danny Friedrich. I'm a professor here at Teachers College in curriculum and teaching. I don't teach literacy. Right, so, but I'm interested in something else. Um, I'm interested in the way in which the science of reading advocates have drawn on two different things. On one way is science of reading as an issue of racial justice. And by doing that, all the discussions about pleasure for reading, 
engaging students' interests and all that being framed as an issue of white privilege, right? Sort of the way in which that discourse plays out with people saying, we haven't been paying attention to these kids, so what these kids need is this. And, and so that, that's one thing. And tied to that is also science of reading as drawing from the pandemic's trust in science discourse. So those two things go together, right, for me, in the sense that science, hard facts, and all that is what I'm gonna say, but, and those are different from the soft issues of engagement and pleasure and joy in reading. And so my question to you all is how, if, if you agree with what I'm saying, uh, how to reframe the conversation, right? Because I, I think that the more we talk about pleasure for reading all that, which I, that's, I love that, right? Um, the more, if we don't reframe it, the more open we are is, yeah, for some kids, of course, pleasure for reading all that and, and joy, and, and all that, but those are the white privileged kids. For the other kids, what we need is this very strict, rigid approach to how to teach read. Um, yeah, I, I mean, what you're talking about is this sort of, I think, the subtle sub-discourse rather than the, um, the surface discourse, right? And um, the, the, um, I'm, I'm thinking back to 1967, uh, when Jean Chawl wrote a book called The Great Debate. <laughs> and she pointed out in that book that, uh, that there were some groups of kids who were more dependent on structured phonics instruction than other groups of kids. And so that was perhaps one source of this dichotomy and of course, and you know, if Ken Goodman had um, a leg to stand on, which he did, one maybe, uh, that leg was precisely this leg, that the most boring instruction, the most structured and drill focused instruction is what we are most likely to offer the, the kids who most need uh, excitement and engagement in school, right? Um, so I, and which is why, which is part of why I reject this dichotomy. <laughs> I mean, the fact of the matter is that if you're reading about something that's of interest to you, those, that reading is composed of words and the words are composed of letters yeah. and it is perfectly possible to construct a good uh, medium phonics instruction <laughs> program with any reasonable text that would be of interest to a first grader. If, but teachers can't do 25 of them per class and they can't do it individually for every kid. And most of them can't do it at all because they actually haven't been uh, given enough tools in their pre-service education program to do that level of curriculum development. So that's why we really need good structured curricula as supports to teachers and options within those curricula as supports to individualization. But skip the dichotomy, it's not this or that. And there's as much serious scientific research on motivation in predicting reading as there is in vocabulary predicting reading outcomes. Motivation isn't a soft and squishy field. I mean, it's kind of soft, it's kind of crappy research, but it is a lot of it. <laughs> considerable amount of research on the psychology of emotions from a language perspective, a cognitive perspective, so they're not indivisible. Thank you. So I'm Amanda Howard and Fox. I graduated the Deaf Education Master's Program and PhD programs here, but before that I was in uh, reading education. Um, and I now chair the education department at Iona University, so I'm really interested in you know, how we prepare teachers to teach literacy well. And I've been reflecting on Dr. Snow's original question about how we go from being somebody who really would kind of like a script to somebody who's very critical of it, to somebody who is like annoyed that someone would even hand you one, right? And I, and I think that comes from trying things um, and they don't work, right? And then you try better, and then you realize you're better at it because you learned what didn't work, right? And it reminds me, uh, one of my favorite educators was a, a, a co here here at Teachers College. He said once that teacher development is going from being um, conscious, unconsciously bad to consciously bad 
to <laughs> consciously good to unconsciously good, right? And I, and I think that's really real, and I, I think that the only way to become consciously bad is to have a really good sense of how to know how well what you're doing is working, which comes back to assessment of reading, and I think comes back to being really honest that we're, we have much better science around what it means to read well than we do around what it means to teach reading well, right? And so if you know what it means to read well, then you can assess if what you're doing is working, and then you can get better, right? But if all you know is somebody's idea of what it means to teach well, then you can't, you can't do that as well, and you can't get better. That's me. Thank you so much. Hi, um, my name is Leanne Werlein Hai, and I also work in the uh, after school sector um, for an organization called New York Edge. And we're uh, doing literacy in over hundreds and hundreds of schools. Um, you said something, um, Professor Snow, that I thought was, uh, that I would love to hear more about, because I think it's at the root of a lot of our problems. And I know I'm always struggling with how to explain this to people. You said something along the lines of, the dichotomy between language comprehension, you know, people who favor language comprehension approaches to those who favor phon phonics, to be, it, it's a dichotomy that's really about worldview. I, I said worldview, but he said it was an economy that was, could you talk more about that? Well, I, this is, I'm happy, to, I'm happy to hear other people's comments on this. It just seems to me that, um, that it, there is something very closely connected to identity Right, that, um, and I, I is it, why are emotions around this so high, for one thing, right? Why do people come up with terms like phonicators? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you guys are at Teachers College. Of course you haven't heard that. <laughs> the rest of us out there in the real world have heard that term. Um, it's that, that when, you, when you buy into, shall we say, a particular approach to teaching reading, you have somehow identified yourself with a much larger, uh, with, with a community and, um, a, and a, the, the sort of implicitly with the rest of this worldview that's associated with that a commitment about how to teach reading. And that, I think it's dangerous, and I think it's, I think it's wrong. But what right? is the worldview that you, what is the difference? Well, the difference is, do we want children to thrive and follow their own interests, or do we want to tell them how to do it, right? And obviously there are things we have to tell them how to do, and there are things where they need to thrive and follow their own interests. And there are ways to connect those two, those two uh, agendas, right? There, is, th there are ways to at least narrow the gap between those agendas. But what I see in schools I work in is very nice, uh, you know, kind of uh, storybook-based uh, chunks of the reading hour, which are often shrunk down to a few minutes by the fact that the two or three adopted phonics programs, which are not connected to those storybooks that are being read aloud and discussed in any way, are um, scripted and easy to implement and um, are things that te teachers are accountable for implementing. So those kind of grow to take not the prescribed 30 minutes or 35 minutes, but 45 minutes or 60 minutes, and then we get to read the book and discuss it, and that's down to 10 minutes. And I mean, I, I kind of hate the idea that we have a phonics program over here and a bunch of books to discuss over here, but that's at least kind of a, a you know, a reasonable distribution of time. I would so much prefer if we actually had a curriculum that embedded mm -hmm. the phonics instruction in a, in, a, in a rationally sequenced way, which there isn't one rational sequence. There are some irrational sequences, but, but there's not one single rational sequence. Um, into the books that the kids want to read. And I mean, in, 
1869, the McGuffey brothers managed to do that. So it can't be that hard. Comment. are running high because there are parents like me all around the country who had suicidal 10 year olds that couldn't that couldn't read and so some of their teachers became in, in also very high emotions but I think that's this level of high emotion is like my kid is suicidal he's age 10 he can't read and then the quarter million dollars I spent and our taxpayers spent thank you um, to teach him how to read um, and he's still kind of unstable because he learned to read so late. He's g going to college next year, but still, I think that's where these emotions are coming from around the country. Thank you. And, and that is, shall I say, a counterexample to the notion that um, phonics instruction is is sort of code for for poor kids or kids in, in schools serving poor children. Thank you. You're up. Yes, hi. Uh, my name is Ronnie Silver. Uh, I'm an alum of Teachers College, class of 69. Uh, I studied with Ann McKillop, Dale O'Brien, Margaret Mead, and uh, many, many other exciting professors. Uh, I decided that I was going to be a teacher when I was in the second grade. I'm a first generation immigrant. My parents were from Poland. And after I struggled with learning how to read and then accomplished that by the end of second grade, I started to teach my parents English. Mm -hmm. And so now, many, many years later, I still love teaching and I'm still working and I'm now getting requests uh, to tutor the children of children that I tutored many years ago. I did teach in New York City, and I did have 30 children in my classes in Washington Heights, and I did manage to do a certain amount of individualization. Uh, I want to thank everybody for putting together this wonderful symposium, and I'm glad that after all these years where I did not visit Teachers College, I came back and it sounds as if your programs and your students are just as exciting today as they were when I was here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hi, I'm Fran Meyer. I was a student at Teachers College for 10 years, and I also taught at Teachers College for 10 years, and I'm now with Metropolitan College of New York as an associate professor and a field supervisor. So I do want to say uh, a couple of things. One, uh, I go so far back that when children with disabilities were not allowed in their local schools, uh, I was involved with a middle school of 600 emotionally disturbed and learning disabled children. I want to point out that we had a department of 10 remedial reading teachers, okay? And the idea that we can ask our classroom teachers today to teach explicit uh, reading instruction, I think is very unrealistic. Uh, and I do believe that we have to speak up to our politicians and find greater funding uh, for our, our teachers because we're really overwhelming them uh, you know, years ago, you didn't have as many ELL children, you didn't, and in New York City, we put up to 12 children with disabilities in a general ed class. We're asking our teachers to do too much, and they're overwhelmed. So I just want to mention uh, that, you know, uh, the, the role of a remedial reading teacher is significant in terms of helping general edu te education teachers accomplish these goals here. The other thing I'd like to mention is that in some of the courses I teach, we review universal design for learning. And uh, Dr. David Rose, uh, who uh, was the founder of CAST, uh, frequently talks about how uh, books are going to disappear and that children are going to depend on listening. And New York State does talk about reading, writing, listening, and speaking. 
And I just think that uh, the value of listening combined with reading is a significant tool for helping our children acquire knowledge, which is the basis of all education. Uh, so I, there are other ways of acquiring knowledge, and I think it's been very valuable for children who have not been able to learn and used to fail science and fail social studies because they couldn't read, but now they can listen to a book. So I want to point that out, and I'd like to hear about uh, whether, how you feel about some of the apps that have come about. Because as a field supervisor, I've noticed that a number of schools, just this past week, a student said to me, uh, one of my student teachers, she said, oh, don't come period three because the whole school is involved with iReady. Mm -hmm. Now, as you know, iReady is an assessment tool. Uh, we also have uh, students in our college who are learning uh, IXL, all right? So in terms of looking towards the future, I think that there are other areas we have to embrace, and who knows with the artificial intelligence coming along, where we're headed with this, and the other thing that Dr. Rose points out is the brain research, where he points out how the brain of a dyslexic child only lights up in one place, whereas the brain of a typical reader lights up in four places. But maybe there are children not, not diagnosed with uh, a, a disability, and only two areas or three areas line up, uh, light up. And I just think instead of saying that the pendulum should be towards the middle, I think it really depends in the future on how we can come about diagnosing uh, children and how their brain is functioning. I happen to have started my career in brain injury, and both Teachers College and Yeshiva University conducted a research study many years ago on, uh, on, e uh, on um, brain research. And I thought that was the beginning of looking at how the brain functions. So I, I'm wondering if any, any of you would like to comment on that. Uh, by the way, I just want to end and thank you for this closed captioning. Uh, kudos to Teachers College because I happen to be a hearing impaired person. And thank you for having a panelist that represents deaf and hard of hearing. Thank you. We have a, a respondent on the side. I'll just add, um, I just wanted to say thank you for bringing up Universal Design for Learning. Um, in the Elementary Inclusive Program, we spend a significant amount of time unpacking Universal Design for Learning um, with, with regard to our literacy courses, as well as our core course where we do curriculum design work, um, and that al also how that connects to participation structures and so forth. So we do spend a significant amount of time on UDL. Um, with regard to your question about um, apps or other digital texts, we certainly agree that students listening to texts as well as uh, watching and looking at texts as they read is a certainly an important step for accessibility for many students. Um, oftentimes when we do talk a little bit about uh, accessibility, we talk about reading intervention as sort of one branch, but we also talk about issues of access. And assistive technologies and other technologies out there can really afford students um, a wonderful opportunity to experience and read grade level texts that they're interested in that perhaps they can't yet decode. So um, certainly UDL and thinking about technologies is a part of our program in very big ways. Thank you. I think um, in terms of you know the organizing question here about like what is this, how should we be preparing teachers? I think one of the things I've never figured out as a teacher educator is this question about at what, at what point do we focus a lot more on giving access to the content through assistive technologies and multimodal instruction and at what point do we you know, kind of lean away from that intervention work, you know, I, I'm speaking as a parent here, um, and Susan wants to jump in. I'm just going to say, I think for a person who's worked with the, um, readers with disabilities at all grade levels, I mean, my most recent background is with adults um, with literacy difficulties, I think it's a combination of the two, mm -hmm. particularly for adults and for adolescents, 
it's a hard job to get them to accept the fact that they want accommodations and they'll say, no, I don't need them. Um, so the major obstacle there is getting the child, getting the older learner to accept the fact that accommodations are, are legitimate for them and lets it levels the playing field for what they can do and what they know. So, but we never give up on the intervention. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. Hi, thanks. I'm Katie Cunningham. I'm an alum of the doctoral program 15 years ago. I'm an associate professor at Sacred Heart University and primarily teach the literacy courses. Um, this was a gift of a day, so thank you. Um, it exceeded my expectations. Mm. And it models, I think, respectful dialogue about this vital question that y'all have posed for the day. Um, I'm also the mother of two boys, um, one of which has dyslexia. So I appreciate your comments as well, because I drive a carpool of kids for whom their three years of school outside a district will cost over a million dollars. That's astronomical. I think of it every time that I drive them to school. And how many kids don't have the opportunity for that kind of access? Um, is partially why we're all here. So I've been on a journey, I've made a ton of shifts to what I emphasize in my courses. And I think in answer to your big question here about how are we preparing teachers to navigate these waters, I think we have to take a hard look. We have to let go of some practices that maybe we've held sacred in the past that aren't working for large populations of children. We have to look at what we center and what matters most, like your points about relationship building. We have to have humility, to use Lucy's word from earlier, um, and that's really hard work, but I think it's not either or when it comes to word recognition and language comprehension. It's yes and. Um, and probably my greatest gift coming out of TC's programs was really to be critically oriented toward words and the world. And I'd urge us to be you know, critical of this idea that if you are for the explicit teaching of the code that it's associated with republicanism, and that if you're for you know, knowledge building and rich language experiences and immersion in text to change the world, that you're you know, democratic leaning. And that somewhere, right, so I think we have to be critical and we have to call that out and say that's not working for anybody. Um, so just some thoughts. Thank you. <laughs> Go ahead. Hi, I'm Christy Folsom, and I haven't been back to Teachers College for so long. Um, I came from a fifth grade classroom in 1994 and started my doctoral program, hardly able to read articles. And so I have a, you know, I'm kind of compassionate about the idea of how do you read, and how do you read a variety of things. It took me a while to get into that. Um, and I, while I was here, I brought from my deaf education background, my gifted education background, a passion for thinking. And this morning, Celia mentioned that one of the jobs of Teachers College is to make teachers who can think and who can be, you know, think their way through things. And so that's what I spent my time here doing, was building a model that put together thinking and social emotional learning. And so that's what I've spent my time doing since then, when I graduated in 2000, is teaching teachers how to, to use f very fundamental processes of thinking and social emotional learning to do their planning. And I used um, two of Lucy's students to do my dissertation research and um, I've taught around the world now with this, but I think that the, when I see that Dr. Um, Snow. Snow is to have had cognition and education, I feel really strongly about that, about how thinking, which is, com you know, we all have that in common, and we all have social emotional characteristics in common, that can really help inform our teaching and teaching and our planning and how we are flexible in what we're doing with kids. And it also helps kids understand their learning. So 
Thank you, Teachers College. I'm glad to be, I'm glad to be back. I came from Houston today oh. so that I could come. And because I really wanted to do this, I have an apartment here, so I'm staying in my own apartment. But I'm also in Houston a lot with my oldest son's family, and their daughter just became six years old. So I made it back from Athens to her birthday party this week. That was a good thing to do. And I'm, she, I've been passionate about this reading because we've been working on reading. Three, four, five years old. And so I got very interested. And so when I, this popped up on my um, email, I decided I'm coming back for cool. this. So thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. All right, it looks like we have one, one more. My last, okay. Sounds like it. I hope it better, I'll make this good, I'll try. Um, <laughs> Celia, I just wanted to address what you um, brought up before about this idea of um, reading to learn at, the po at what point, you know, the way we have traditionally taught is, you know, we teach reading and writing, and then by third or fourth grade, children need to be able to read to learn. And that's because, you know, we've been teaching through textbooks. Traditionally, that's how we teach. So we've been teaching according to this knowledge transmission model. And I think, you know, looking at the way our culture is, there's much more DIY and people, you know, um, taking control of their own learning, I, I see us moving more toward a knowledge creation model where children are learning through inquiry and, and contributing at an earlier age, where you know we're now developing social practices, how you know ways to be how to be a scientist, how to be a mathematician early, where reading and writing aren't the aren't primary necessarily. Well, maybe they'll continue to be primary, but not necessarily the only way to learn and produce. And can we, can we not have it, you know, such a rush to develop these skills or there's so much pressure on children, maybe not developmentally appropriately to be able to be these great readers and writers by the time they're nine years old, where they can kind of develop along their own timeline mm -hmm. and develop these other skills for learning and, and produce knowledge. Um, my, you know, I'm interested in maker spaces and teachers who run maker spaces, and that's kind of where this comes from. But, um, but that's, so, you know, that, that just triggered this idea that I've been thinking about. So. Hello, um, thank you for this opportunity. So, um, I retired as a principal ten years ago. I'm here with my former principal, who was the principal of the school for thirty years, and um, we're here today just because we care so much about what's going on. Um, currently, for the past 10 years, I've been an adjunct supervising student teachers at a CUNY school. So I'm just really responding to this question, how are we preparing the teachers to navigate future teachers, as well as the cooperating teachers that I've worked with in several schools for several years now where I have relationships. The, you know, what's just happened in New York City with the mandated programs um, is just such a frustrating and it's a difficult position for us because um, as we want to impart to our student teachers or pre-service teachers, you know, everything that they take the coursework and everything that's led up to this final semester and then they're placed in classrooms where the, the children are following along, I, I'm not going to name programs, but I will say that when they have been in schools that have implemented a more balanced literacy approach where phonics is taught, but children are reading appropriate books, children have choices, there is so much development of both the reading and writing connection, opportunities to collaborate when reading groups and partnerships, those things are all going away and children are sitting and following for a whole week reading one story, an Eric Carle book. It is driving me insane. It's driving them insane. The teachers are having a difficult time adapting. We've seen it with a program that had been in place five, six, seven years ago, got dumped. Now we're going through that pendulum swing once again. We've heard from the researchers in the field, Marzano, schools are great at adopting one initiative, now we're going to the next initiative, and it's so episodic. 
And you're hearing the teachers saying, I'm quietly quitting. I'm just going to hand me this, and I'm just going to follow it. This is what I'm hearing. I had 10 student teachers. I was in six different schools with 10 student teachers. Why? They're in a master's level program, becoming duly certified. Some of them were in place because they're either paraprofessionals or teacher assistants. So rather than move them, they let them stay. So I've seen it, and I've been in city schools and suburban schools. So this. This is happening, you know, not just in one place. I think the only thing we can say is that we, those of us who are still in the field and passionate, we have to be become the activists. We have to embolden our students to speak up, to speak out, to get actively involved, you know, write letters of response, blog. Um, I, I don't know what else is going to happen because you're hearing it from the principals. They had no choice in the matter of these changes that are happening. I'm speaking about New York City now. These things are happening, yes, because parents are frustrated at some of the lack of progress that they're seeing. It's understandable, but we know that just shifting, dumping, and going to this next new wonderful program that's going to help all children with a one-size-fits-few approach, we know is not gonna work. It hasn't worked in the past, so. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to give the last word to Dr. Euler as we're reaching time. Oh, that was uh, a big surprise. There is one more person. Can Sorry. we take, can we, pardon? Oh, you did. I didn't even see you there. And Marcel, you're in charge. Go ahead. Okay, hi. So, um, I am a graduate of the speech pathology, now communication science um, program. I'm also duly certified. We have a teacher of speech and language disabilities pathway in that program. Um, I did the program. I, I came in class of 2002, and I've been practicing in the field, primarily in Brooklyn. Um, I've worked in top 1% schools all the way to government-funded community-based programs um, in Brooklyn. Um, and I am a parent of three children. They are now soon to be 16, 14, and nine who um, participated in the New York City education system. So I'm very familiar um, of the education system from different pathways, from the parent perspective, from a clinician perspective and from an educator perspective because I practice with both my licenses. And I know this struggle, and I'm also um, Ghanaian American. I came to America as a teenager, so I have a global perspective on education as well. And this whole dialogue about, I wanna say fighting <laughs> over which approach is best suited, I think takes away from focusing on what's more important, which I see. I'm also actually um, at Harvard now. I'm in Dr. Snow's class right now. <laughs> Let's just put it in. You know, and I'm, you know, with the pandemic, everything that happened, and seeing how children learn during the pandemic, and seeing different communities um, struggling to learn or not learn, and seeing what's happening now in the real world. We just have to, admit that what has been going on might have been working for some, but not for everyone. And we have to not just look at it from an American perspective, but from a global perspective, right? So America is not the only English speaking country in the world. And other places are able to sort of kind of do the reading instruction and figure it out. Um, although testing is not the best approach, when they do the test, we all see the scores where we fall. Um, and I, my hope is that we can all work collaboratively. So I was excited to see that there were different people from different programs. I was excited to see Dr. Hammer here because when I went out of the field supporting teachers, and I still support teachers now, how are you supposed to teach students how to read when you don't even know phonetics? Like, you know, in my science speech, 
brain, that's how I'm thinking. Like, okay, to read, you need to know the phonemes, you need to know this, you need to know that, and phonemic awareness and all this foundation that helps make instruction appropriate. So uh, my hope is that we can sort of work together to come up with something that not everybody has to do, which Dr. Snow is saying, like a national, something that is a national thing that if even educators are not able to use, parents can, can use on their own because parents want to support their kids, especially parents from my community. Social promotion has been going on for years. There are real world consequences for our kids being socially promoted and struggling, so we can't afford to just relax and go with the flow. It has to be addressed. So my hope is that we can all work collaboratively, figure out a way, and not squabble on what is the best way, um, look into other countries who also speak English, where they are doing that works, and you know, build on research and, and make things better. So that's all I have to say. <laughs> So much. I know at Teachers College we are working really hard, all of us who are teacher educators, to have conversations with each other and alongside each other, and for that I'm grateful. Okay, so now we're really, really going to do the last comment. Should I say something? Yeah. First of all, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Snow, for joining us here at Teachers College, and of course, thank you for the rest of you. Uh, you mentioned that we were number 56 or 57 in the nation. Okay, I was wondering, uh, years ago I attended a conference uh, uh, regarding Finland and their reading program, and it turned out that Finland has very, very few uh, poverty, children living in poverty uh, versus New York City, for example, all right? No less than the uh, rest of our nation. I was wondering, which country is first today, and could you just very briefly summarize, what are they doing differently that we're not doing? And, and, and actually, why are we 57? Uh, is it that we're dealing with so much more than other countries are dealing with? This is, in, this is not in reading scores. We're not that far down in reading scores. This is in reading enjoyment. It's, it's the kids' level of positivity toward reading. Um, Finland is, is actually, I think you can see Finland on that list. It's not so high either. Um, so, it, whatever they're doing, their kids are learning to read, but they are not learning to love to read. And, um, th and if you were asking about scores, Singapore is always the first. Just live with it. Singapore always wins. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We're doing really well for time. Thank you, Dr. Mentor. So, um, thanks for staying with us throughout the whole day. And I want to thank two groups, one individual and one group of people. This has been my first year as Vice Dean for Teacher Education, and I'm thrilled that the faculty from across many disciplines who uh, get together on a regular basis and plan what we're doing are invested in continuing these public dialogues about teacher education. Uh, I want to say that our points of difference might not have emerged so strongly today, but when it came time to picking a keynote speaker, there was only one person that we all agreed on. So I'm so grateful that Dr. Snow joined us. Do you want to say any last word before we leave? Okay. So look for our next forum. Uh, I've proposed that it be on emergent bilingual and multilingual uh, students, particularly in light of kind of one size fits all programs and what needs they might have that aren't being met in the fall. Thank you.